Hello everyone. Today we will be discussing one of the most decisive battles in history, the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, which led to an end of Roman expansion up north. In 7 BC, Rome added the region to the empire as province Germania. However, subduing the tribes was not simple, especially due to the lack of centralization and an administrative center to control the region. Aside from their military strength, the Romans had a bargaining chip, a common practice to ensure the loyalty, or at least subservience of tribes, was to take children of chieftains to Rome in order to receive Roman education. These children then became soldiers, and if they are talented, became commanders. Among these boys was Arminius, born to Cheruscan chieftain Sejimer, showing an excellent talent for military matters. He distinguished himself by helping crush the revolt in Illyricum. Attaining incredible prestige, Arminius' next mission was to aid Varus in maintaining control of the new province of Germania. Once he arrived in the province, Varus ensured he became the new chieftain of the Cherusci. For that, he married Thesnalda, the daughter of the previous Cheruscan chieftain Segis. Though Segis was a loyal Roman ally, sources indicate he opposed the marriage, and bad blood grew after the couple eloped. Varus trusted Arminius blindly, but his prodigy was planning a Germanic uprising behind his back. This was challenging, as tribes weren't organized and were traditional enemies of each other very often. Slowly but surely, the organizing of a widespread uprising against the Romans began taking shape. Arminius ensured Varus continued trusting and relying on him. He often asked the governor to resolve disputes between Germanic tribes, flattering his ego. In the late summer of 9 AD, the campaigning season ended, so the Romans began preparing their annual trek towards their winter quarters on the Rhine. Arminius volunteered to organize the march, much to Varus' delight. While planning the trek, he notified Varus of several supposed uprisings in the region. With the size of Rome's army, it would be easy to crush them. To do so, Arminius suggested they should march through the Teutoburg Forest, a densely wooded forest with hills and swampy terrain. Varus agreed, as Arminius knew the territory and would surely lead the Romans in the right direction. After that, Varus ordered scouts to ensure the passage was safe and they were not trekking into an ambush. But these scouts likely were Germanic auxiliaries who were aware of the Arminius plans. However, Varus was still not able to suspect anything. Things went just like Arminius wanted. As the Romans trekked through the woods, it became clear the terrain was not ideally suited for their military formations. The Roman legions, 17, 18, and 19, some 18,000 soldiers, limped through the narrow paths. Usually, Roman armies traveled in formation, but now they had no other option other than just to stretch the column thin and walk in lines of two or three tops. Also, around 10,000 camp followers, family members, tradespeople, and a long trail of baggage wagons were traveling with them. And the archaeological evidence of mainly Roman coins reveals the stretch of the Roman line was up to 20 kilometers in length. Deep within the Teutoburg forest, Arminius left the column. He either informed Varus he was going to gather more auxiliary units or was going to scout ahead. Because of the trust, Varus continued the march. Little did he know Arminius gathered troops, but not to aid the Romans. Instead, he took the command of around 20 to 30,000 Germanic warriors who had gathered for the showdown. It includes Germanic people along with Arminius, Cherusci, Marci, Chatti, Bructory, and many more. The Roman column had to trek through a narrow, rugged area between the Great Bog, a swamp, and the Calcri Hill. Because of the clattering of their equipment, no one heard the rustling of leaves as thousands of hidden eyes followed them. While the Romans passed through the bottleneck, the vanguard passed with no problem. But with a part of the army in front and a massive row of baggage wagons behind, there was no room for maneuvering for the strung out position of the army. Still, nobody suspected their every move was being followed. Then, out of the blue, trees fell down the path. A barrage of spears and javelins filled the sky before crashing into the Roman columns. The damage of the surprise attack was enormous. Legionaries tried to take their defensive positions as well as they could while being pestered by missiles. The first significant cracks were already showing, especially because infantry armor was designed for close combat, not against sharp projectiles. And no melee fighting had even taken place yet. Soldiers panicked during the initial ambush but had no place to get cover. Many of them fled into the swamp. Wearing their heavy kit, survival was impossible. To the rear, where most of the army, the baggage wagons, and Varus himself walked, nothing hinted at the disaster in front of them. When the column suddenly stopped marching, their initial reaction was to push on. 
This only worsened the situation for those soldiers stuck in the ambush. Afterward, a loud rallying cry marked the charge of hundreds, if not thousands, of Germanic warriors. The already battered Roman lines certainly put up a fight, but fortune was not on their side. Some of them managed to push back certain parts of the barbarian line. However, these soldiers soon discover the constructed rampart between the hill and the forest. It puts them at a significant disadvantage. Ferocious and merciless combat ensued on the narrow pathway between the bog and elevation, as the Romans knew they were fighting for their lives. To make things worse for the Romans, rain began pouring down. It turned their heavy armor into their worst enemy, as being soaked with heavy equipment impeded their flexibility even more. Nevertheless, the lightly armored barbarians continued their hit-and-run attacks, retreating in the dense woods whenever the Romans gained the upper hand. After hours of the onslaught, word finally reached Varus of what was going on. But he probably thought it was just a minor skirmish and gave the order for the rear to push forward to aid their fellow soldiers. But all this time, up to 10,000 warriors had hidden on the eastern side of the Calcris Hill. The Roman column now passed this contingent of hidden warriors. As they passed, these now charged into the column, launching a similar attack to the Roman vanguard, resulting in a breakout of a brutal fight. With that, a several kilometer long killing zone got developed. Romans in the middle and rear of the column broke rank, suffering similar fates as those of the vanguard who had tried to flee in vain. Many drowned in the Great Bog, others were hunted down by warriors hiding in the woods. As day turned into night, the Romans still persevered despite the carnage. Finally, a significant portion of the army reached a clearing. Varus ordered the establishment of an impromptu military camp in the woods. It is safe to assume nearly the entire surviving army was stuck in the woods. Arminius held off his initial attack because he was familiar with Roman tactics. He knew they could fend off any attacks as they dug in. The night was quiet, and several of the supply wagons even reached the camp. On the following day, Varus ordered the burning of the wagons and the Germanic warriors continued their hit-and-run attacks on the column as soon as the Romans left their encampment. Archaeological evidence does not reveal if the Roman column erected a new camp or retreated to their previous one. For sure, during the second night and third morning, the Germanic tribes attacked the Romans non-stop. Somewhere during the onslaught, the cavalry broke rank. It didn't matter, as they were hunted down or drowned in the Great Bog. For three entire days, the slaughter continued. Barely any Roman soldier has managed to escape. Varus had been betrayed in the worst way possible. Seeing his situation as hopeless, he took his life on the battlefield. A classical source attributed to Publius Annius Florus described the aftermath of the soldiers who surrendered. They put out the eyes of some men and cut off the hands of others. They cut off the tongue of one man and sewed up his mouth, and one of the barbarians, holding the tongue in his hand, exclaimed, That stop you hissing, you viper. Following the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, Arminius laid siege to Aliso, the nearby Roman fortress. The siege failed, but the Romans abandoned the region nonetheless. Losing three legions meant the Romans lost over 10% of their military force. It was an enormous blow and an embarrassment to the mightiest state. The defeat marked the end of the Romans' expansion to the north. The Rhine and Danube now marked its northern border. But the expected Germanic invasion from the north never came as Arminius could not unite the Germanic tribes in the subsequent years. This brings us to the end of our video. If you like the video, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more of these videos. Also, don't forget to share your opinion with us in the comments section. We'd love to hear from you. As always, thank you so much for watching until the end. See you guys in the next one.